I'm Al Phil Reese, and this is Poem Talk at the Writer's House, where I have the pleasure of convening three friends in the world of poetry to collaborate on a close but not too close reading of a poem or a few poems. We'll talk, maybe even disagree a bit, and perhaps open up the verse to a few new possibilities, and we hope gain for a poem or poems that interest us some new readers and listeners. And I say listeners because... Poem Talk poems are available in recordings made by the poets themselves as part of our Penn Sound archive, writing.upenn.edu slash Penn Sound. Today, I'm joined here in Philadelphia at the Kelly Writers House in our beloved Wexler studio by Lainey Brown, whose recent book is Translating the Lilies Back into Lists, published by Wave in 2022. And among whose many other books is a collection of essays on the poet's novel, the poet's novel as a form of defiance of 2020, and, among many others, periodic companions of 2018 who teaches creative writing at Penn and is the coordinator of ModPo, our open online course. And by Maya Pindick, member of the faculty at Moore College of Art and Design here in Philadelphia, whose third poetry collection, Impossible Belonging, won the Philip Levine Prize for Poetry and came out with Anhinga Press. Did I say Anhinga, right? Anhinga Press. In January of 2023, Maya, congratulations, that is exciting, and who's recently co-authored a book on the teaching of poetry. And that book is called A Poetry Pedagogy for Teachers, Reorienting Classroom Literacy Practices, published by Bloomsbury in 2022. You people are so busy. And by Hua Wen, a poet born in the Mekong Delta region of Vietnam, raised in the D.C. area and in recent years a resident of Canada, author recently of A Thousand Times You Lose Your Treasure, Wave 2021, winner of a Canada Book Award and a finalist for the Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award, the National Book Award, and the Governor General's Literary Award. Wow. You're killing it. And before that, among other things, Violet Energy Ingots, 2016, Tells of the Crackling, 2015, and Red Juice, Poems, 1998-2008, published in 2014. And As Long as Trees Last, 2012, and who's reading here at the Writer's House, which will have happened by the time this episode comes out, will be viewable as a video recording at the Kelly Writers House YouTube channel and also at Wa's Pen Sound page. Wa, so good to have you here Thank today. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is a quadruple header for you. We had a conversation about Alice Notley before this, and then you'll be working with Laney's students. Did I miss anything? And this, and then a reading, the, the one that I mentioned. So glad you're here. Thank you so much for having me. And it's been how long since you read at the writer's house? 18 years. Yeah. So we're on some kind of weird 18-year cycle? It's, anyway, <laughs> well, it's just... like a locust. <laughs> no. Is it 18? <laughs> Actually, it's 17-year cycle, yes. 17, a luckier number, right, Maya? Good yeah. to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. This is your first poem talk. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thanks. Very excited. And Lainey, my friend? So happy to be here. How are you? I'm excited. Great. Well, the four of us have gathered here to talk about two poems in Mina Loy's Love Songs, which she published in 1915 in Others, Others Magazine, just ahead of her arrival on the New York modernist scene the next year. Loy would die at the age of 83 in 1966, and in 1965, the poet Paul Blackburn, who loved nothing more than to drag his tape recorder and set a tape recording going, uh, recording poets reading and talking, along with Robert Vasdias, interviewed Loy at her home in Aspen, Colorado, and asked her to read poems, including all 13 of the love songs. This one hour and 36 minute conversation, reading conversation, is available both as a single recording and segmented recordings, poem by poem, and segmented by interview topic at Penn Sound's Loy page. So here now is Mina Loy performing Love Songs number one and number four. 
Born of fantasy, sistingly appraisable, pig cupid, she's rosy snouts, rosy, rooting erotic garbage, once upon a time, pull the weed, white star stopped, star topped, among wild oats, sown in mucous membrane. It's clever. It's very good. Yes. I would an eye in a Bengal light. Eternity in a skyrocket. Constellations in an ocean whose rivers run no fresher than a trickle of saliva. Yeah, it's quite good, isn't it? But that's why they said I was so frightfully moral. Fancy talking about a trickle of saliva. These are suspect places. I must live with my lantern, trimming subliminal flicker, virginal, to the bellows of experience. Colored glass. <laughs> this is number four. Evolution falls out of sexual equality. Prisoner miscalculates similitude. Unnatural selection <laughs> breed such sons and daughters as should gibber at each other. Uninterpretable cryptograms, no, cryptonyms under the moon. Give them some way of brain brassly for caressive calling, or to homophonous hiccups transpose the laugh. Let them suppose the tears are snowdrops, or molasses, or anything, then human insufficiencies big in dorsal vertebrae. Isn't that funny? That's beautiful. Magnificent. <laughs> They're very funny. Yeah. But I never, I never discussed anything about doing, writing in an particular way which should be modern or more comfortable. I don't know how to say. I must have been somebody I lived in. I learned in a former life. I certainly did have some subconscious memories of a former existence. I've forgotten how to prove it now, but I could at the time when I had the memory. We were talking about that the other night. You remember? Yeah. yeah. Well, what did I say? <laughs> Had I any reason, there was something I could remember that I knew about. But I can't remember it today. One day I suddenly remembered it. I do Number four does continue there on the next page after vertebrae. Oh, Oh, it goes on, thank yes. you. Give them some way of brain. That's rather nice. Some way of brain grassy for caressive crawling. Does it mean anything to anybody? Absolutely. Has, I get the meaning across. Do I? don't know. For caressive crawling, also homophonous hiccups transpose the love. Let them suppose the tears are snowdrops or molasses, or anything, than human insufficiencies begging dorsal vertigo. Let meeting be the turning to the antipodean and form a blur, anything, then seduce them to the one of simple satisfaction for the other. Well, in a minute, I'm going to give you, who traveled the furthest to be here, the chance to tell us which one of the two we should start with. But before that, so think about which one you'd want to start with. Before that, I'd like to go around and get everybody's impression of this voice, this elderly person's voice, and the whole engagement. And it's obviously incredibly charming, among many other things. Lainey, what was your, th feel, your thinking as you were listening? Well... I can't help but think about how she's pausing in the middle of her poems, digressing, 
and even forgetting that there's more to the poem and then returning to it. And in a way, it seems in keeping, surprisingly, because there's so much in the poem, right? They're, they're very condensed. So you liked the conversation, reading conversation, as she's giving us some memories mm-hmm. and encountering this for the first time maybe in a long time. It's information we don't usually get. And also her whole attitude is so relaxed. In other words, there's not this preciousness of, I'm going to read my poem from the beginning and the end and no mm-hmm. interruption, which is more conventional. Mm-hmm. But she's not, she's anything but that. So you would argue that Zach Cardner, the editor of Poem Talk, should leave in the conversation, even though we never do that in Poem Talk. I would say yes. Okay. Maya, you would agree? I, w- I would second that. Yeah, okay. I, I also love this, like, playful playfulness and, and relaxed um, vibe that she has in reading the poems, and then also just how she kind of forgets that there's... Or I don't know if she's pretending to forget or actually forgetting, but, um, yeah, there is something really refreshing about hearing hearing her read the poems that way. Um, and it does feel, yeah, the lack of preciousness really, really resonates with me in hearing that, that they're just like, oh, here's these these poems I wrote, and I kind of forget, is there another lot, right, or what comes next? And, and also, does that mean the, anything to you? Does this mean anything? You yeah, know? <laughs> yeah, right, like, in a sense, um, yeah, I think, I think playing a little bit, I don't know how much of it is actually, like, forgetting or just kind of playing with that idea, mm. but... It's either humility or quasi-faux humility. Wow, what do you think of the voice you heard? I, yeah, it was, it was actually wonderful to hear that she was disarmed by her own poem. Like, oh, isn't that clever? Like, re-remembering what she had written, like maybe had set this aside for a long time. Um, I know that she withdrew from poetry and like the biography. And so maybe she just hadn't read her own work. And this was written a number of years before the recording. So I appreciate it. 50-some years. Yeah. It's almost exactly 50 years. What would what it's going to be like for you 50 years after writing a poem You're to, right. to re-encounter it? You don't have to answer that question. I think it already sort of is happening. I've been <laughs> <laughs> reading something I wrote 25 years ago. Mm. I'm like, oh, who wrote this? Mm. And oh, isn't mm. that clever? <laughs> okay, well, you can pick which one, number one or number wow. four. Let's remind everybody there are 13 of these, and this pen sound recording includes all of them. Which one do you want to start with? I I can't help but want to begin with the number one. Okay. Um, May I ask you, since Loy is, she reads it beautifully, but the recording isn't perfect, I wonder if you would be willing to read it. It's not the easiest read, so I'm sorry I didn't prepare you for that. Oh, that's okay. I don't mind mind giving it a read. It isn't long. Some of it reminds me of your poetry, by the way. I like the disjunction that and the insertion of of um, things that come in from from elsewhere. But I'll go ahead and begin. Love songs, one. Spawn of fantasies, sifting the appraisable pig Cupid, his rosy snout rooting erotic garbage. Once upon a time, pulls a weed, white star topped among wild oats, sown in mucus membrane. I would an eye in a Bengal light, eternity in a skyrocket, constellations in an ocean whose rivers run no fresher than a trickle of saliva. These are suspect places. I must live in my lantern, trimming subliminal flicker, virginal to the bellows of experience, colored glass. Wow. What a poem. Okay, let's all four of us make a little list or enumerate some of the tactics or linguistic strategies she, or poetic strategies she used. There, there are a bunch of them. Lainey, first, what is a tactic of hers? Um, I would say one tactic is constructing unlikely couplings like pig-cupid. So usually we would think of Cupid as, as cherubic and angelic. And, and not messy like a pig. And not a pig. Not rooting. So, Although there, there is something very erotic about rooting, but we'll, we'll leave that aside for a second. <laughs> Maya, tactic, strategy? I would add taking really grand ideas, really big things, and kind of um, collapsing them or plummeting them into a gooey image or really specific tactile kind of carnal um, image. So bringing things to the ground that might seem kind of lofty or up in the air. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to elaborate on that a little bit, I was noticing how... 
she would have like a micro, macro view, like the constellations in an ocean, and then later the micro, the trickle of saliva. I love that sort of, that kind of enormous to the tiny. And then I was, I started to say that sort of insertion of once upon a time, the sort of quotation that comes from outside of the, of the poem coming in, in the middle of that first stanza is something that, that I was admiring. And it's also obviously a reference to storytelling and yes. uh, the earliest Oh, forms. I want us to talk about that once mm. upon a time, but introducing it while as a tactic is perfect. And by the way, also that reminds you, me of something you would do as well. Um, and others, you know, Ray Armentrout would do that and so forth. Uh, so my term, I would say the wonderful idiomatic contorting, uh, sowing wild oats. When you've mentioned a pig, you can't help but the, think about the pig really enjoying the, the oats, <laughs> rooting in the oats, and generally the mixed metaphors, right? So we've got a whole set of little tropes about constellations we also have this, this terrestrial rooted saliva trickling groundedness at the same time. And she uses both vocabularies as she moves along. So Lainey, what is the result? I mean, we have a poetry here that is brave in violating poetic convention, certainly at its in its time. I think she's defiant against romanticizing. Uh, sexuality. So it's an anti or a post romantic or anti romantic modernism. Yes. You'd say. Mm -hmm. Does that sound right, Maya? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm thinking also I had was reading her feminist manifesto, right, where so many of these ideas are spoken in a very different way. But um, one line that I had jotted down was women must destroy in themselves the desire to be loved. And I feel like that's so much in in the language, like taking down the the idea, the sort of manufactured, man-made desire um, connected to romance and idealized love and fairy tales, um, which actually it seems like she's performing, right, the statement that they keep women women down and and needy and debased, right? Um, so I feel like that that eye on misogyny is is so much performed and enacted in the language. Let's turn to the, t the, the interest of hers in sexual, erotic, romantic topics. There's a lot of it here, obviously. And she's got an attitude toward it that might be characterized as um, poetic sexual revolution. And certainly the moment, 1915, the moment for that. Where do we start, Wa? Uh, maybe with the isolated line of the poem, these are suspect places. What are these? Which mm. these? Which places? Well, I think the tropes that we we uh, w which still need unpacking of the f of the first stanza. This um, instead of baby, this um, piggy, cupid, rooting garbage, but then is also pulling this this white star topped weed. That's also <laughs> inside or sewn inside a membrane, which is like the, the interesting between like the the oats that are like in a field, but then suddenly, um, you know, more something more in in, in tissue, maybe vaginal. Um, so, I, and and also, I was thinking about the final stanza in this reference to the the virgins trimming their wicks. We were talking about that earlier, Lainey and I which is a reference, a biblical reference to the book of Mark, the virgins trimming their wicks. And I think she's playing with that trope and trying to, you know, cast a different light, one that's humorous and clever, as she says, oh, that's clever. Um, and, and you know, it's funny and sardonic at the same time. Suspect places I can list would be Bible stories, myths about romantic loves, starry skies, you know, Orifices, body orifices. Um, these have been suspected by I convention. Ideas these of womanhood. These are all suspect places. These are places that women should be on high alert to realize it's nonsense. Maya, would it be too much of a stretch to say that 
rooting erotic garbage or just erotic garbage, which she turns into, she's, there's, there's a transvaluation here. This is a good thing, erotic garbage, so-called supposed garbage, I think. Um, is it fair to say that that is kind of an ars poetica for this, for this series, that she welcomes all that stuff in, in letting it into the poetry? It's interesting. Like that, that's making me um, think about her position in relation to the audience for this. Like I, I wonder, she doesn't seem like she's above it, but she does seem to pos- position herself outside of it, like seeing it with this obviously critical and playful and, with, you know, s- subversive and irreverent eye. Um, but I feel like that that part, all those layers up until these are suspect places or like these fragments that are kind of building up almost like a palimpsest to me of, right, like all these these deluded um, ideas about love. And then, and then we get to this complete thought or sentence, right? These are suspect places. That's kind of like calling it like it is. So I don't, I wonder how she positions herself in it. I, I feel like she's, it's, it's interesting to hear your reading of the trimming. That's really helpful, right? The trimming of subliminal flicker. Like, um, I think I saw it almost, I was reading it almost as her tempering her own desire. So I wondered if she was seeing herself also as part of this as well. Hmm. Well, what are your thoughts? Um, well, I'm not sure how to read that last, that last, I mean, it's, it, she says, I must live in my lantern, but it's my lantern. It's a different place. I think she's trying to emplace herself, um, that has some agency, although it's acknowledging a uh, lack of agency at the same time and sort of being inside of the suspect place, um, and but but I love that also that the begin <laughs> that the o- the very opening line is is referring back to this um, Cupid this piggy Cupid that that it's a spawn of fantasies and whose fantasies are they um, that that seems to be a question that she's asking I don't think they're hers first poem in a series title of the series love songs we've talked about love as content. We talked a little bit about songs as mode. Obviously, she is staking some ground here about what poetry can be. So I guess I would love to hear your thoughts, maybe all of us, on some hints, some metapoetic hints in the poem that wink at us saying, this is what I think poetry can do to include desire, frankly. I mean... You talked about my palimpsest as a mode. I and I could be wrong about this, but I think one of the things she's implying here is palimpsest is itself sexy. That is, as a mode, this is this poem is itself engaged with the erotic as a form, as a kind of writing. How am I doing, and where would you go from there with the meta? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say, I feel like um, it's so much speaking back to conventional syntax, right, and conventional ways of of being poetic or writing a poem, that it seems like the the performance of dismantling that, right, or like the wildness and the wildness of language, right, that comes through, um, which is totally. Cra- I mean, it's it's like it is totally wild, right? It's like taking. Um, all these fragments that are bringing, like, bringing together, pushing together these binaries and this language that's like, it took, it took me so much time with this poem, right? Like, and I had a dictionary and I was thinking about each, right? Like, going back to each line, it's almost like there are these codes and there's so much underneath this act of like, here's one thing and here's what's actually underneath happening. And I feel like that's happening in her writing. I don't know if that's clear. It's like, Playful, but also trying to expose something at the same time. And that in itself, the poetic mode is liberating. Liberating in a poetic, aesthetic sense, yeah. but liberating in a social sense as well. Yeah? Mm-hmm. I think she's wanting to separate sexuality and eroticism from romantic love. So it's pro-sexuality. It's not anti-sexual desire. It's just 
let's separate that from all of this baggage that isn't really working for women as in the feminist manifesto when she talks about the three options for women are to be parasite prostitute or or spinster those are not she's not interested in those but it doesn't mean she's not interested in erotic oh by no means yeah there is like definitely i thought before you shared that with me of the the dichotomy of of whore virgin. Um, and I love how in this first part of the, uh, the last part of the first stanza, where she would eye eternity constellations. Of course, those lines also end with in a Bengal light, in a sky rocket, in an ocean, right? So these sort of like conceits of distance, conceits of massive space. So I think she is, she's interested in something eternal, something that's beyond the social conditioning when it comes to erotic love, when it comes to the possibilities of of romance and love itself. I think she's also really interested in the body. I mean, this already mm-hmm. came up in our conversation, right? Like putting the corporeality in the body in a way that's not sentimental, right? Like even the poles of white weed star topped. I was looking at different flowers and one that it could most likely be a star of Bethlehem and the common name is Sleepy Dick. So, you know, she's like literally, you know, pulling it out. And then the next line is, well, I already mentioned, that's that's like, um, you know, fertilization, ovulation. So she's, there's a lot of play happening there. Let's turn to the fourth poem. Lainey, would you be willing to read it? It's there again. Um, sure. It takes... Loy some time to read it, and she also inter- interrupts herself. So I think it would be good for us to hear it from you. Are you okay with that? Sure. Evolution fall foul of sexual equality prettily miscalculate similitude. Unnatural selection breeds such sons and daughters as shall gibber at each other uninterpretable cryptonyms under the moon. Give them some way of braying brassily for caressive calling or to homophonous hiccups, transpose the laugh. Let them suppose that tears are snowdrops or molasses or anything than human insufficiencies begging dorsal vertebrae. Let meeting be the turning to the antipodean and form a blur anything than to seduce them to the one as simple satisfaction for the other. Thank you. Let's accumulate some of the tropes that are in this one. Who wants to start? Well, uh, I'll begin. Um, um, you know, she begins this number four love song with the word evolution and later you know, refers to the Darwinian natural selection by calling it unnatural selection. So she's interested in thinking through sort of the constructs of human dominance or human forms um, through time and challenging some of those constructs. Yeah, she she seems to be, especially with unnatural selection, mocking the Darwinian assumption of species improvement by sexual selection. That's a pretty radical thing to be doing. Yes. So I love that. That's that's a great first one. Is there another trope that you want to point out, Maya? Um, I don't know. I don't know if it's a trope, but thinking thinking about the use of alliteration, right? The brain brassily, the homophonous hiccups as a way of also like stripping these ideas down to language and and sound. Um, And that also feels like a move of of bringing it down to the elemental, to the body, um, the body of syntax. And as a writer of lines in 1915, there is a relationship to what someone like Wallace Stevens is doing with a very different set of ideas. Homophonous hiccups might as well be, you know, from uh, some poem from Harmonium. Um, Williams is doing this, HD to some degree. They're, they're really working together. I actually think Loy is 
at least here, better than all of those <laughs> in doing it. All right, Lainey, another trope? Um, I think she keeps riffing on equality or inequality and kind of coding, giving different names for things to show that there is not an equivalency. So she's starting out talking about sexual equality um, and miscalculating how the how the genders might be the same. Then we have gibber, um, foolish or useless talking, uninterpretable cryptonyms. So instead of pet names, you know, code names, and and this continues on. Tears are snowdrops or molasses. So there's this kind of, I think she's pointing to. Uh, this gap between what's real and what are the romantic associations again for tears, it? for equality, for all these different roles and assumptions in in hetero relationships. What is an uninterpretable cryptonym? A code name that is can't be interpreted under so the moon. Code name is used, but we don't know what it's referring to. I think she's making fun of lovers under the moon saying, sweetheart, darling, and instead they're saying, they're, they're, they just have foolish talk and the, what they're saying to each other is uninterpretable. So she's pro-jibber? No, she's, she's saying, making fun of it. Give them some way. Let them suppose. Let meaning be the turning. She's actually, I think, trying to address that mm -hmm. in the later parts of the poem. So is this the result of unnatural selection? I think she's she's trying to find a different way of talking about it. Mm -hmm. So uninterpretable cryptonyms makes me think of the colored glass at the other at the end of the other poem. There, I mean, colored glass is the non-transparency, which she is aesthetically in favor of, and the opacity. I, I read colored glass as almost a reference to the church. church? Stained, like glass. stained glass. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. She's saying, I think at the end of that poem, virginal to the bellows of experience, colored glass. She's, she is saying she's, she's not interested in that kind of experience that's dictated by the church or by being virginal and waiting up with your lamp for your lover. Um, and the flickering candle reminds her of the conventional uh, space for such a thing, the church. Well, the idea that you're, you know, you're you're waiting, you're chaste, you have your lamp trimmed, you're dutiful, you're making sure the oil doesn't run out, all of that. Yeah. Instead, let meeting be the turning, and then form a blur. This is in the last stanza of the number four. And form, form is capitalized. Yes. Mm -hmm. Form a blur. There's the opacity again. Mm -hmm. Let meeting be the turning. What a great line. What, what, what's going on there? Meeting meaning uh, people meeting? Relationships? I, I read it as... Meeting people meeting and turning being both right a moving toward and into, like a turning a turning to. I was stuck with antipodian, like what that was so wild to me. I was trying to figure out what it is that a meant. word. Yes, a people from, might be antipodian. Who antipodian. knows? Antipodian. Yeah, what's it mean? Inhabitants of New Zealand and Australia. It, Those who live in the other it, pole. It also means opposite. Okay. Contrary. So turning to the contrary, which I read as a contrary to, again, this romantic notion of I'm going to turn to my lover under the moon who has a body. No, I'm going to turn to something that's the opposite of form with a capital F and not be seduced by this idea that I'll find my other half and everything will be perfect. Anything other than, is that what she means there? Anything other than to seduce them. Mm-hmm. Anything, but don't do that. Don't don't fall for this line that when you find your romantic partner, life is a breeze, everything is perfect. Who's being addressed in the fourth poem 
when the speaker says, give them some way, somebody is being commanded, somebody is being asked, is that us? Is that everyone? I feel like it's lovers. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was torn between it being both men and women, like hetero lovers, right? This That she's this romanticized version that she's right, these foolish sons and daughters gibbering. But is it also specifically women that she's speaking to? That would be them. Who's doing the giving? Is I, it the poem that does I, it? I think she's, it's the poet. The poet, um, I mean, she's talking about sex, right? So she's talking about sounds of people having sex and put that in the poem, not like a sigh. Put the, you know, the real sounds in. And maybe also let allow them to transform and, and not be static. They can the tears that are supposed could be snowdrops or molasses. This idea of them not being fixed. Let's go back to once upon a time. Wa mentioned it, but we didn't get far into it. Why does it appear there? How is it Loy esque that she does that? Well, I was interested in Once Upon a Time because it obviously it's this uh, way that typically one starts a story, and here we, we encounter it in the middle of the first stanza, sort of isolated without referent. And it, and it recalls um, often tales that have to do with um, sexuality, right? And particularly think of um, Little Red Riding Hood, say, for example, um, or other other tales where often um, the the woman char- the woman protagonist is in, in in danger or waiting for some rescue of a lover and so on. So I feel like that's an important referent in that love song. It's a, a little bit of a way to talk back to that those structures of narrativity. So it's ironized. Yeah, I think it's complicated. I think it's also. I want to go back to what. Maya said about palimpsest, because I feel like it's also putting it in the middle is showing how the poet is going to rewrite the narrative. And things transforming into things, that's a fairy tale trope. So we, t- we were talking about the tears that are, that are snow drops or molasses. I, again, thought about, you know, the, the tear can be romanticized. Like I think of the beautiful tear and Beauty and the Beast in the film, right? It looks like a diamond. And no, it's like it's sticking to the face. It's it's a problem. Um, it's not what we thought it was. So she's playing with that fairy tale. Anything could be anything. Maya, your thoughts on Once Upon a Time? I mean, I think it's 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 the language that we're all familiar with. It's the cliche. It's the fairy tale. And it's just putting it there verbatim is also like, well, here's the material of what we've all been fed and what we all love and what we pass on to to our kids and mm. um and and that we grow up believing and hoping for, right? This this so I, I love that it's actually just the words, right? She's not like substituting anything for that language, but there it is. Um and I think as you were saying also about it being in the middle is so is so interesting, right? Because yes, it's it's happening and yet that that hope, that beginning is is in us, right? And sort of like so entrenched. I think of Loy as, it's a version of modernism, but the modernism that we mostly think of and are taught is the modernism that says, make it new. She's in a way interested in the modernism that says, you can't say it that way anymore, which is a version of make it new. And going back to four, we've got, give them some way of, let them suppose that. Maybe, as Lainey was hinting, she's talking, encouraging herself as a poet. She's also encouraging poetry to do this sort of thing. All right, let's, go, let's get final thoughts. Uh, something you came today to talk about and haven't had a chance to yet. So who's got one? Well, I was just thinking about how she joined the futurists in 1913, but left in 1915 because of the misogyny there. And she says in her aphorisms on futurism, die in the past, live in the future. So I feel like 
this is a call to live in the future. So this is a turn already in 1915 away from that, Mm -hmm. it seems, right? Can you see a little bit of vestige futurism in the language? I think the wild play, for Mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the juxtaposition. I mean, even going back to the once upon a time, if we just look at what comes before and what comes after, you know, just that juxtaposition, that that's a very wild, you know, once upon a time begins with the pulling up the flower. That's not how the fairy tale usually begins. The skyrocket is also probably a little bit futuristic, mm-hmm. homophonous hiccups. Wow, you were going to say something? I was going to point to the skyrocket sky as yeah. the futurist, uh, maybe remnant. Yeah. But and and then I'm appreciating how she then brings it back to the body or to this watery space that feels very antithetical, antithetical rather, to the masculinist futurist project. Yeah, totally agree. And I think that the li- this is liberationist in a sexual revolution sense, in a way that the futurists were not at all interested. Mm-hmm. They're not interested in liberation. They didn't believe in liberation. She seems to believe in it, in the wildness that can lead us there. Maya, final thought? I think I'm thinking, I'm sitting with the lantern as as her space of, of truth, in a way, and also a protective space through which she can see from that light. Um, and also just her trust, it seems, in her audience that she is not writing for men. And this is not a convention, right? She, she is she is defying and being irreverent to convention, but also I feel like has a trust that that people will listen and hear in her way, even though she has no interest in popularity or, right, or, or being um, accepted, there still feels like there is a care for how these are how the, how her words are received and by who within the, the the irony and the wit she she's fully trusting her her seeing and her critique in this in this language and i find that just a, amazing um how it how it unfolds in each of these songs wonderful thank you wa final thought um i'm not sure i have a final thought i i i really appreciated um um, these love songs because they they seem so radical and um, and contemporary. They really do. Um, my final thought puts a, creates another context or tries to create another context for Loy. I'm not the first to say this, but New York Dada, which is happening just a little a year or two after, but she actually Loy was in New York for the for in nineteen sixteen, maybe nineteen seventeen, before going back to Europe. I think. Mm-hmm. So I think of someone like Elsa von Freitag Loringhoven, who was you know less coherent, interested in the same kind of spawn of fantasies, and the feminist Freudianism that was involved with the Baroness, overt about her interest in Freud, Central European interest in Freud. I think Loy has a little of that. Spawn of fantasies, These, this language has to be thought of as birthed by allowing fantasies to be part of the language that we use. Completely revolutionary when you think of it in that context. Better New York data than futurism, I would say. Hmm. Well, we like to end Poem Talk with a minute or two of Gathering Paradise, which is a chance for us to spread wide our narrow Dickinsonian hands to gather a little something good that's going on in the poetry world or the art world or the film world or the dance world. Lainey, do you have something in mind? I do. Um, I want to shout out two newish publications by the late, great poet Bernadette Mayer, Milkwood Smithereens, which is out from New Directions, a collection of poems, also, her collection of letters with the poet Clark Coolidge called All This Thinking, the Correspondence of Bernadette Mayer and Clark Coolidge, which is out from University of New Mexico Press. Great recommendation. Maya. I just want to shout out um, the new um, anthology of essays and poems and artwork and interviews so we can know writers of color on pregnancy, loss, abortion, and birth edited by Adeselis Girmay, and it is such a powerful and moving um, compilation of, of experiences and histories um, around those choices, and really amazing. I think it came out with Haymarket just this month. Oh, that sounds really exciting. Um, 
I would like to um, shout out the the 50th anniversary edition of Diane de Prima's Revolutionary Letters, which City Lights brought out, and also the UK Press, Silver Press, uh, brought out recently. Um, and then also just thinking about modernism and um, feminisms, um, HD's, you can find HD's experimental film on YouTube, and um, I'm fascinated with it. It's this anti-racist film, silent film that she made with Briar, her lover. And it and it's available on YouTube. You can you can leave the the um soundtrack on. Someone put a jazz soundtrack to it, but or you can turn it off to get the uh, original impact. But it was also about it's called Borderline. It's about like liminal spaces and queerness and identity. Um and like Mina Loy, it's radically experimental. I want to recommend, it's obvious, the, and I mentioned at the beginning, the Mina Loy pen sound page, which has all of this series in it. It's definitely to be heard. And, of course, it's a combination interview reading. It's just fantastic. The elder poet looking back, it implies this beautiful instinct of people starting in the 50s but really got underway in the 60s as recording devices became so much more portable to go back and find poets of the previous generation and record them and spend afternoons with them and these afternoons are recorded it's just a, a really intimate thing that recording can do you think about it, it happened she wrote it in 1915 they recorded it in the mid 60s and here we are so much later and that intimacy never goes away um and I think and HD recordings also uh, have that same feel about them. Of course, so much of it is the later work. She didn't really make, we don't really have audio recordings of the early work that we, the way we do with this. And secondly, I get to, as your host, um, was reading, which is not, is happening in the future as we're talking, but will have been the past by the time people are listening to this. And that will be available uh, the video of it will be available on YouTube, the Kelly Writer's House channel. And, of course, eventually it'll go to Penn Sound. And Lainey and I and others had the great pleasure, as just to remind Poem Talk listeners, had the great pleasure of a WA-centered Poem Talk. Did you listen yet to that? Well, I watched the live taping. You watched the, oh, the unedited. The unedited. So um, okay. I haven't, I'm, I'm waiting to listen to the edited, but I feel like I got the... The, you know, the raw version, which was so wonderful to, to listen to. That was a setup. You didn't really have to just praise us, you know. Um, we would have edited it out if you hadn't. No, but seriously, it was just absolutely wonderful, and I highly recommend that people go back to that. Well, that's all the homophonous hiccups we have time for <laughs> on Poem Talk Today. Poem Talk at the Writer's House, a collaboration of the Center for Programs and Contemporary Writing, Penn Sound, and the Kelly Writer's House. Here at the University of Pennsylvania, thanks so much to my guests, Lainey Brown, my appendix, Wa Wen, and to Poem Talks directors, plural, and engineers, plural, Zach Cardner and Paul Burke. Thank you, guys. And to Poem Talks director, the same amazing, one-of-a-kind unicorn, Zach Cardner. Next time on Poem Talk, I'll be talking with Bruce Andrews, Rachel Blau Duplessis, and Bill William Fuller, who will have traveled from Chicago to talk about Ted Pearson's Cantonary Odes. This is Al Filris, and I hope you'll join us for that or another episode of Poem Talk.